Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our seminar. Our speaker today is Andrew Hochstetler. He's a member of the Order of Friars Minor Conventual. Conventual. Completed, uh, he completed an MA in the Early Christian Studies at the University of Notre Dame and an MST in Syriac Studies at the University of Oxford. And he's now in the final stages of his doctorates on the departure of Mary in six books and the sixth century Syriac cult of the Virgin. Uh, he's been working on, uh, on this at Oxford under the supervision of David Taylor. And he also serves as a Franciscan priest in Istanbul as part of his order's custody of the Orient and the Holy Land. Some of his exciting research can be read in his article that was published in 2022 in the journal Apocrypha and can now be heard and seen in just a few moments live on your screen. Andrew, the floor is yours. Thank you, Andy, Mario, and Dan, Georgia. It's really exciting to be able to share some of this research with you from my dissertation. Uh, I'll share my presentation now. Can do that. Okay. Yep. And we'll try to make this full screen here. Okay. Hopefully that'll come through. Is that good? Okay. Today we will be looking at the Virgin Mary's final fate in one of the two earliest texts in Syriac that deals with the end of her life. It's called The Departure of Mary in Six Books, and it offers an account of Mary's final days on earth and her journey through the afterlife. It also tells us that the whole point of its own composition is the celebration of Mary's feast days, which it describes. You can see an outline of the six books in story form here, and we'll come back to examine the events of books five and six in detail later. Previous scholarship is often focused on comparing the departure with other Dormition and Assumption texts. Some of the best scholarship has delineated the literary relationship between the departure and around 40 texts in 11 other languages. The extant Syriac text of the departure is the earliest version in its literary family, known as the Bethlehem and Incense, or just Bethlehem tradition. Yet the focus of much of the earlier scholarship has been to get at the hypothetical Greek forlaga of the departure and to compare it with other Dormition literature. Naturally, there's a desire to get back to the earliest form of the text. My own uh, doctoral project, however, has been to examine the extant Syriac version of the text and the cult of Mary that it promotes. There is no uh, published critical edition as of yet. A chunk of my work has been to edit and translate one set of palimpsest fragments. Another step in my research has been to identify different recensions of the text among the earliest manuscripts. I'll just point out here that there are three early recensions, uh, according to my study, long, medium, and short. A comparison of these recensions among themselves and also with other Arabic, Ethiopic, and Greek versions in the Bethlehem tradition indicates that the long recension is the earliest. There's a progressive shortening, especially of direct speech. It doesn't really matter who's speaking. Everybody gets their speeches shortened, including Jesus himself, the main character, as well as Mary. And the long recension also has an internal date, 497, 498. That allows us to date the production of the first Syriac departure text to the 6th century, if not the last three years of the 5th century. Another section of my work is focused on locating the context in which the Syriac departure was produced. Yes, there are elements that seem to come out of a Palestinian Greek liturgical tradition, but there are also numerous literary, theological, and liturgical ties with texts associated with Edessa. The departure as it exists in Syriac was circulating in the 6th century in a Syrian and or Mesopotamian Miaphysite milieu that sought to link itself to the city of Edessa. Here I've mentioned recensions, provenance. We'll come back to these later in the presentation. Some of the earliest scholarship uh, analyzed the departure, not based on literary criteria, but along theological uh, criteria, the state of Mary's final fate. And some of the questions that people were interested in, in were, did Mary die at the end of her life, or did she pass directly into heaven? If she died, 
was she resurrected? Did her body and soul still arrive somehow in heaven in the afterlife and then get resurrected? And was that resurrection unique? Was it different than what the rest of the dead were doing? If she was resurrected, was it temporary? And was her resurrection in a place of temporary waiting? Or was she already in the place of her eternal reward, what we might think of as heaven, what the term we might use today would be heaven? Now, we can talk more about the historical context of this scholarship in the question and answer time if you wish. For now, suffice to say that some of these studies were not always attentive to some of the specific details of the text, in part because not all of the manuscript witnesses were available that we have today. Sometimes they were imprecise about the categories of paradise uh, and heaven, but especially of paradise, and what that meant in late antique communities in which the departure circulated. There's a good summary and a critique of this scholarship in Stephen Shoemaker's 2002 monograph, Ancient Traditions of the Virgin Mary's Dormition and Assumption. So moving on from there, what does the departure actually tell us about Mary's final fate in books five and six of the departure? It's a type of apocalypse and otherworldly tour. So starting from the end of book four, Mary dies. The apostles transport her body to the earthly paradise that is Eden. At the same time, Christ sends her soul to the mansions of his father. At the beginning of book five, Christ shows up in paradise and resurrects Mary. Body and soul are back together. Mary has a quick look around, and then she travels with her son through three levels of heaven, distinct from paradise. First, she goes to the natural heaven, which is the location of the physical elements, such as rain, as well as of the prophet Elijah, who was taken up into heaven, according to the scripture. Then the second is the heaven of heaven, which in which angels sing praise. And finally, the third level, the third heaven, is the heavenly Jerusalem, the dwelling place of the Trinity. The virgin worships before the Trinity and then is taken to see Enoch at the extreme limit of all creation. So apparently a place distinct from the heavenly Jerusalem. We move now to book six, in which there's a slight shift in perspective. Mary sees two worlds, the one which passes away and the one which does not pass away. In the world which does not pass away, she sees a crowd of deceased righteous people gazing upon a beautiful place, but from a distance. They're waiting for the day of the resurrection in which they will enter this space. The text does not specify if these are souls, it just says the deceased righteous, nor does it name the place of their reward. Mary then sees a crowd of deceased sinners who await their eternal punishment in Gehenna, gazing upon it from a distance. She then returns with Christ to the paradise of Eden, and there she remains in her resurrected state at the end of the account. Finally, she also appears to the Apostle John so she can tell him everything that she's seen. There has to be some way for all this information to get to us, right? The reader of the departure. More recent scholarship has raised three questions about the meaning of this text, broadly speaking, three areas of, of question. The first, uh, Richard Baucom, writing in 1998, examines the situation not just of Mary at the end of her life, but also of the dead righteous and of the dead sinners during her otherworldly tour in book six. Both groups are in an intermediate state waiting for their eternal reward or eternal punishment. Baucom notes that this is a particularly early eschatological view. One variation of this view in which the dead are unconscious or have very limited consciousness is called the sleep of souls. Now, already in the late second and early third century, most Greek and Latin Christian writers begin abandoning this particular view of the sleep of souls in which the dead have limited consciousness. Rather, they adopt a view in which the dead are already experiencing some form of their eternal retribution or their eternal reward. They're already getting a taste of heaven and hell. And they have a greater level of consciousness in this immediate retribution. Now, there are, of course, exceptions to this. It's not entirely uniform. Brian Daly does a good job of covering both the nuances and the general trend in his survey of early Christian eschatology, hope of the early church. In that survey, Daly notes that belief in the sleep of souls persists for much longer in Syriac communities, especially in the Church of the East, than in the Greek and Latin traditions that are abandoning it. To return to Baucom, he says that since no other apocalypse composed after the second century has this particularly early eschatology, the departure must also be early. If not second century, then fourth century at the latest. Now, there are a couple of 
difficulties with Baucom's approach, uh, one or limits to it. He's only looking at books five and six, not reading the text as a whole, and we'll address that in a bit. He's also only comparing the departure with other works of the apocalyptic genre. He's not, for the most part, looking at Syriac literature. Stephen Shoemaker has noted this problem and has done some work to correct it, but he also continues to cite Baucom as an authority for the work's early dating, so it's worth addressing Baucom. Moving now to Shoemaker's 2002 study, he corrects previous scholarship which did not recognize that Mary experiences what he calls a special and enduring resurrection in paradise in the final books of the account. Some of the earlier scholarship said that she once again, her soul and body separated after she had done her tour of heaven and of Gehenna. But as he notes, the departure actually describes the virgin obtaining a resurrection that the common dead normally only receive at the final judgment. Shoemaker also begins to interpret the departure in its Syriac context, especially when defining the significance of paradise. Mary remains in the earthly paradise, not heaven, at the end of the departure. What does that mean? Shoemaker recognizes that paradise in Ephraim, by way of comparison, is both the earthly garden of Eden and the eschatological reward of the righteous after the final resurrection and judgment. You can only enter it with your body at the day of the resurrection, after your body has been reunited with your soul. And he notes that in the departure, only embodied individuals enter paradise. This would suggest that it is the eternal reward of the just. But some uncertainty remains for him on this point. In fact, I'm going to summarize, there are three questions that remain unanswered in this previous scholarship that I've touched on. Perhaps more important or most important is the question of the significance of paradise in the departure. Is it actually the final resting place of the just or just an intermediate place or state of waiting? And we'll look at specifically why Shoemaker asked this. Second, does Mary fully resurrect in all the different manuscript versions of the departure? Shoemaker asked this as well. Finally, the third question is a bit more general. What does the departure's view of the common dead, so the intermediate state and the sleep of the souls, tell us about its historical context and about its view of Mary's final fate? This question corresponds to Baucom's early dating of the departure. We'll look at the last question first. Our first step is to examine all of the departure, not just books five and six. Book Two and book four of the departure present a very early version of the sleep of souls after death. They depict the dead as lying unconscious in the grave, with no reference to the fate of the soul as distinct from the body. In this in book two, Mary prays that God will send the apostles to accompany her during her final hours on earth. He sends clouds that take them from all over the world to come to her side in Bethlehem. Additionally, the Holy Spirit temporarily resurrects Andrew, Philip, Luke, and Simon the Canaanite. The text says that they were already, quote, inside their tombs, and they rose from within Sheol. The Spirit tells them, quote, you should not suppose that the final resurrection has arrived. Rather, you have been raised today from your graves wholly so that you may go to greet the mother of your master, because the time draws near for her to depart from this world, end quote. In other words, don't get too excited. This is a temporary resurrection. It's not the final resurrection. Later in book four, this sleep of souls functions actually as a plot point. At this point in the narrative, Mary has already died and passed into the afterlife. The apostles are discussing whether to make 12 copies of the account of her final hours, one copy for each apostle to take with him. Peter decides against this because, he says, the apostles from among us who were dead, who, behold, are going to their graves. Shall we write the book of Mary for them? The implication is that those who are returning to the intermediate post-mortem state in the grave will have no use for such an account. They have a limited level of activity and consciousness, no time for reading books or spreading the message of Mary's final hours. This would be considered what we would say an even earlier view of the intermediate state than the one we saw in book six, where the deceased are gazing on their final reward or punishment. But does it mean that this text cannot exist after the second century? by using Baucom's reasoning, or maybe the fourth century at the latest. These descriptions of the apostles' temporary resurrection actually reflect a view of the sleep of souls found also in Afrahat and Ephraim. These fourth century authors describe the natural human soul as asleep with the body in the grave or in a separate location, Sheol, prior to the final resurrection. Afrahat states, 
When people die, the natural spirit is hidden with the body and sensation is taken away from it, and the natural spirit is buried in its natural condition. Elsewhere, he concedes an anticipatory, dreamlike consciousness to the dead. Many of Ephraim's hymns present the soul in the intermediate state having no sensation whatsoever while the body is dead. Narsai, in the 5th century, concedes some additional consciousness for the souls of the common dead, but they are in an intermediate state, unable to gain new information as they wait. In the early 6th century, unconscious sleep is the image most often used by Jacob of Saruk. The doctrine of the sleep of the souls was still being promulgated in the Church of the East by Patriarch Timothy I in the 8th century. Thus, this exceptional temporary resurrection for the apostles in the departure actually reveals the contours of an understanding of the sleep of souls that was common among West Syriac writers in the 6th century, even later in the East Syriac tradition. Even the departure's alternate description of the sleep of souls in Book 6, which we've talked about briefly above, remains within the range of early variants found in Syriac writers such as Ephraim. In Book 6, during her otherworldly journey, Mary observes these dead people waiting for their final judgment and eternal reward or punishment in an intermediate state. But unlike the apostles who lie in a dark grave, the deceased righteous in the world which does not pass away, i.e. not this earthly existence, are standing on this side of the tabernacles which are their eternal reward and looking at these tabernacles. Christ clarifies for Mary that, quote, from a distance, they, as in the righteous deceased, see their bliss, for the moment has not arrived for them to receive their glory, i.e. the tabernacles. Similarly, Mary views deceased sinners standing on this side of the darkness, which is their eternal punishment identified as Gehenna, weeping and sad as they stand at a distance. Again, Christ clarifies that these deceased sinners are still in an intermediate state. Quote, for from a distance they see their punishment, and they know for what end they are being held until the last day, for the day of their judgment has not arrived. End quote. This version of the intermediate state includes a greater level of consciousness among the common dead than that found previously in Book 2 and Book 4. Yet even in Book 6, this consciousness is limited. The deceased righteous and sinners can only view their future fate. They are apparently unaware that Mary is observing them. Now, it's not unusual for individual Christian writers in late antiquity to hold multiple seemingly contradictory eschatological views. I mean, these, these two different views, slight, slight variants, could be from different sources being drawn together in this text. But on the other hand, it's not uncommon, for instance, for Ephraim has very similar descriptions to both of these versions of the intermediate state in his hymns. As already mentioned, several hymns describe the unconscious, sleep-like existence in a dark, airless shale. The righteous and sinners are there together. But Ephraim also presents an image of the righteous deceased inhabiting, quote, delightful mansions on the borders of paradise, end quote, while they await the resurrection of their bodies with which they will enter paradise. Now, we could go into the variations on this, but for the purpose of this study, what's important is that Ephraim's description of the mansions is similar to Book 6's portrayal of the deceased awaiting their eternal reward, gazing at it from a distance. Afrahat also concedes a certain anticipatory awareness of the future reward or punishment to the deceased who sleep in the grave. Similar beliefs about the sleep of souls continue in the following centuries. Narsai in the 5th century portrays human souls as inhabiting either of two places, one for sinners and the other for the just, separate from their buried bodies but with full use of their reason, will, and emotions. They just can't take in new information. The main point here is that the departure's views on the afterlife Intermediate, the intermediate state and the sleep of souls are the norm in much of Syriac literature up through the 6th century, even later in some traditions. So on the one hand, we can't necessarily use this, at least not on its own, for dating the text as specifically as Baucom does. On the other hand, this Syriac context will also help us later when evaluating how to understand the virgin's final fate. Let's turn now to the other two questions about Mary's final fate. First, do all manuscripts recount the Virgin's full resurrection in the afterlife? In manuscript C, book four, Christ makes a promise to Mary on her deathbed. He says, now I will make your corpse enter the paradise of Eden, and there it will be until the or until a resurrection. Smith Lewis, who edited and translated it, capitalizes resurrection in her translation, implying that it is the final resurrection at the end of the age. 
Unfortunately, manuscript C is entirely lacunose. It's entirely missing book five and six. On the other hand, W, uh, which is from the short recension, in that Christ makes no such promise in book four to Mary. And then Christ uh, W goes on in book five to recount that Mary is resurrected immediately after her death, not at the final res resurrection. And she remains resurrected in paradise at the end of the story. So Shoemaker asks, would Mary have an anticipated personal resurrection in C, which is the long recension, if we had the full text of it? Is that what we would find? Or would we find that she's resurrected at the final resurrection? In other words, is she special? Does she have an anticipated resurrection? Or is it just going to be like the common dead at the final resurrection after at the end of the age? Shoemaker also notes that the fragments in S do recount Mary's resurrection, but he's unsure how S relates to C in his 2002 study. Much tedious work on manuscripts and recensions helps us to answer this one. It's not super exciting, but at least it gives us a bit more certainty. Since Shoemaker's study, we've edited several fragmentary palimpsests, compared the texts, and found that S and C belong to the same long recension, along with S2 and S3. In addition, we can also take G into consideration. G is the medium recension, which wasn't yet referenced in Shoemaker's study. The manuscript G contains both Christ's deathbed promise to his mother that her corpse will remain in paradise until the or until a resurrection, and Mary's anticipated personal resurrection in paradise. The presence of both elements in G is important for interpreting Christ's promise. It indicates that late antique readers, people who put this together, could understand Christ's initial promise that Mary's corpse will remain in paradise until the resurrection to refer to her anticipated personal resurrection rather than the general resurrection. In other words, she's special. She gets her own early resurrection in all the different versions, all the different recensions. Finally, we come to the last question, which is hopefully a bit more fun. What is the precise eschatological role of the Garden of Paradise that Mary inhabits at the end of, her de of the departure? Is it the eternal dwelling place of the deceased righteous people that they inhabit after the final judgment? If Mary is already there, then she's special. She's not just resurrected early. She's already living in the place or the state that others will have only after the final judgment. Or is the paradise some sort of intermediate place, a waiting room before the final judgment? If that's the case, She's special, but not so special. Shoemaker states that the Syriac text of the departure is ambiguous when it describes paradise in Book 5. Christ resurrects Mary in paradise after her death, and she quickly has a look around. Among other things, she sees the glorious bridal chamber in which the righteous will be. As Shoemaker correctly notes, the participle koimin does not have a reference to definite time in itself. It can be translated both in the present tense, so I would say where they are now, and in the future tense, where they will be. Now, Shoemaker translates this as where they were living or where they will live. Wright translates it in the present tense, where they abode. So is the Garden of Paradise an intermediate space in which the righteous are already dwelling as they await the final reward? Or is it currently uninhabited, prepared as the final resting place for the righteous after their resurrection and judgment? The answer to this is to be found by comparing the description of paradise here in Book 5 with the description of the unnamed place that has been prepared as the final resting place for the righteous described in Book 6 that we discussed quite a bit earlier. As Mary looks around paradise in Book 5, she sees, quote, the bridal chambers of the righteous, how they were built and beautified and adorned, and the banquet hall of the martyrs. To this list, the medium recension adds the tabernacles of the children of light, she also sees trees, how beautiful they were in appearance, and how pleasant was the smell of their branches, and how perfumes were diffused from tree to tree, and the sweet fragrance was wafted from branch to branch. It's a beautiful image, and it has some resonances, actually, in the hymns on paradise of Ephraim. We won't go into that now. Now let's compare this with Book 6. As you will remember, Mary sees the deceased righteous gazing upon the place of their final reward from a distance, but it's not named. She sees in that place, quote, many lights shining brightly and bridal chambers without number. And among the bridal chambers, there was a scent of perfumes and trumpets were sounding over the bridal chambers. And she sees the tabernacles of the righteous and multitude standing on this side of the tabernacles and gazing at them. This description takes up imagery, bridal chambers, perfume, tabernacles, used to describe paradise in book five. I'm kind of sad it doesn't have the trees, but most of the other boxes are ticked. In other words, book six is describing paradise that was described in book five. 
Yet in Book 6, it's also clear that the righteous are not currently dwelling there in these bridal chambers. Thus, for the departure, paradise is not an intermediate place of waiting, but rather the location of the final reward of the righteous. Now, to be fair to Shoemaker, he does make this a very brief comparison between this description of paradise in Book 5 and the description of the place for the righteous where they're waiting in Book 6, where the thing they're waiting for in Book 6. Because his monograph covers so much more ground than just the departure, it's very brief. He assumes it's the same place, Book 5 and Book 6, in both accounts. But he wonders, could it be a contradiction? In Book 5, they are already living in paradise, and it's a contradiction with Book 6, where they're still waiting to enter. This is possible. We can't rule out the possibility of contradictions in a lengthy text like this that constantly has parts of it being taken out, possibly added in. But when we read the entire work as a whole, with its very conservative understanding of the sleep of souls in Book 2 and Book 4, and its explicit description of deceased sinners and righteous uh, deceased needing to wait for their final resurrection in Book 6, it seems difficult to imagine that Syriac readers, listeners, editors of the departure in the 6th century, a context in which belief in the sleep of souls and the intermediate state is alive and well, it seems difficult to imagine that they would interpret a single ambiguous participle in Book 5 as suggesting that the righteous already inhabit paradise, when that participle can just as well be understood to mean that the righteous will inhabit paradise in the future. Add to this the fact that the entire text is meant to highlight the Virgin Mary's unique status, and it appears highly unlikely. So to conclude, Mary's final fate and the departure would have been understood in its 6th century Syriac context as entirely unique. Yes, she does die like everyone else, but she also experiences the anticipated eternal reward of the righteous. She has a personal resurrection in all recensions, she inhabits paradise, the location, or we could call it a state of eternal reward, in which not even Elijah and Enoch inhabit, though they do come and visit her there. A little teaser for what where I'm taking this in my research, in my ongoing research, I think that this eschatology also influences the way that the departure constructs the cult of the Virgin, and in particular Mary's intercessory role, but I'll close it here, and hopefully we have a bit of time for some discussion and questions. Thank you so much, Andrew, for this interesting paper and the lively tour on which you've taken us through all of the options of things that might happen in between of dying and living. And I'm sure there are many uh, questions uh, for you. Um, and perhaps uh, to start us off, I was wondering if I might take you up on the detail you mentioned at the very start of your paper. Uh, mm -hmm. You spoke about a uh, progressive shortening of, mm -hmm. uh, of the text uh, through its early reception. Uh, and you in particularly mentioned uh, speeches that get shortened uh, almost collectively. And so I was just curious if you could say a little bit more about what you think that that might suggest about how the text, what, what kind of text this was thought to be uh, and why why speeches sort of fell out of fashion. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you. That's a, a great question. Um, it was really interesting because this text is actually um, circulating in the earliest manuscripts with the Proto-Gospel of James before it. And I was um, also noting, noticing that in the critical edition of the Proto-Gospel of James, that's one of the things that gets shortened is direct speech. Um, and when I started comparing the two, it was interesting to see how the long recension of the departure is paired with a longer version with more speech of the Proto-Gospel of James. And a more medium version, the more the remedium recension is paired with a medium uh, version of the Proto-Gospel of James and the short with the short. So it's interesting to see that there's a, a shortening of the text going on. Um, I think much of that probably has to do with the way that the text is being used. Um, the text itself tells us that it's supposed to be read during the liturgical celebrations for the virgin that it prescribes. So it's presenting itself as a liturgical reading. Um, it opens uh, in the first book actually as a homily. The homilist is speaking uh, to, to his audience and saying like on this feast day where we're celebrating the commemoration of the Virgin Mary, let's remember you know, what she did, etc. So my sense would be that uh, as, they're, as they're going along, they're actually cutting out some of that direct speech to streamline it. It's being used in liturgy. At the same time, we know that um, it's also being, there, there are versions of this in later West Syriac and East Syriac, Lives of the Virgin, where more texts are being added to this, more events. So 
in addition to having the Proto Gospel of James and the Infancy Gospel of Thomas and then this departure altogether, we have events from the vision of Theophilus. We have events uh, recounting like Mary and Joseph going down to Egypt. So in that context, even as the departure has been shortened, there are other texts being added to it to fill out the story of, of Mary's life. So I think it sort of depends on how it's being used, but I would understand this shortening to have to do with, um, especially maybe potentially with liturgical expediency, since that's what the text itself seems to be indicating. Um, it's a hypothesis. Um, I can't say that, that that it's that way for sure. I think, you know, we could discuss what, like, another thing would be, why do I think that it's being shortened as opposed to being lengthened? Because that's just as possible. You could also have a text being lengthened as well. Um, so so there's there's that element um, that's that's quite interesting um, to, to think about and to look at. But um, yeah, so I'll, I'll stop there. Um, Thank you. That's indeed very interesting also within the context of the other texts. And I should note that questions are possible by raising your virtual hand, but also uh, by writing questions in the uh, chats. Um, and now uh, I'd like to give the floor to Shlomi, please. Um, so first of all, thank you very much, Andrew. Really a fascinating text or text. And I was wondering if you could say or elaborate a bit more about the role of Elijah and Enoch in the departure and how it relates to their um, function or there's a abode, <clears throat> abode in the broader Syriac uh, context. That's a great question. Um, I, I'm totally unprepared uh, for that. Um, it's obvious that, that both of them, there are apocalypses uh, about both of them since both of them are taken up into heaven in scripture. There's apocalyptic literature. There's different types of um, earlier literature um, that's in the Christian uh, context and, and some also in the Jewish context, I believe. Um, so there are these texts circulating about their place in the afterlife. I think it's quite interesting that neither of them, according to the, the, the narration, neither of them seems to be living in paradise. Um, so Elijah is living in the first level of heaven, which is basically the natural heaven. It's where the, the elements are. And then Enoch, Mary sees Enoch after uh, she visits the heavenly Jerusalem and sees the Trinity and worships for the Trinity. But she, it says that he's at the extreme limits of creation. So it seems to be distinguishing that from the actual heavenly Jerusalem. So it seems that whoever's um, writing this text, whoever's um, using it, is is obviously aware of the biblical tradition and, and uh, probably also of some of the apocalyptic traditions around them. Um, but also, in a sense, Mary is the more privileged person in the afterlife uh, because she's, at least within this context, she's in paradise. She's there uh, fully resurrected. It's hard. It's kind of hard to know, you know, is Enoch in a better place because he's, he's at the extreme limit of creation? I, I don't know. Um, so so that would be one one way I would understand it, but I, I am underprepared for that. So there may be somebody else who can also answer that Um better than I can, um, yeah. And you mentioned during your talk that um, Enoch and Elijah visited Mary in paradise, or uh, did I misunderstand it? Um, Elijah does. Uh, he's there at the beginning. The apostles also carry her to paradise. So, so paradise is uh, on earth, and the apostles carry her there, and Elijah is there when she arrives. Um, but then when they travel through the first heaven, then Elijah is also, that's where he lives. Yeah. Interesting. I would have to go back, uh, to be honest with you, because there's three different recensions, six different manuscripts. Um, I mean, it's I had them kind of side by side in translation, just so I can check things. It's, and, and some details fall in and out of different versions. So it's always, I'm always comparing them. So it might be that in one, there's, there's, you know, two characters and in the other, there's only one character, et cetera. So I, I, I'd have to go back and look to say for sure, is Enoch not there? I don't remember. Thank you very much. For the next question, I would like to turn to Georgia, um, who would like to ask you about the cult of Mary, I believe. Yes, yes. Thank you very much for the presentation. And I was totally hooked by the final teaser that you left us with. Uh, so you mentioned that you have some ideas on how this text could influence the cult of Mary in the sixth century, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Can you tell us more? Yes. Well, thank you for for thank you for accepting to to. I'll pay you later for this question. Thank you so much. Uh, um, so 
one of the things that you would expect is that because Mary is in the afterlife, fully resurrected in paradise, she must be interceding. You, you would expect, since this text is also about the cult of Mary, and it tells people to it tells people to celebrate her feast days, to bring um, bread offerings to the church, to have them prayed over, etc. Um, and it promises that if you do this, you will receive the benefits of her prayers. So you think, okay, this text is going to show that Mary is in the afterlife praying for us from there. She's she's resurrected. Um, what was really fascinating as I as I read through all the different recensions quite carefully and looked at the way it constructs the cult, it never once says that Mary prays from the afterlife for the living. It's kind of strange. Now, there is a moment uh, when she sees the deceased righteous and the deceased damned in book six. She prays for she she prays to Christ for those who are damned, for those who are the sinners. And she says, um, Lord, uh, she says, have mercy on the wicked when you judge them on the day of judgment, for I have heard their voice and I am sad. So she's asking God to have mercy on the wicked, not at that exact moment, but at the final judgment. And already you see the influence of the understanding of the sleep of souls and the intermediate state because Mary's not obtaining any for them, anything for them in that moment. By, by way of comparison, there is another early Syriac text called the Obsequies uh, of the Virgin. And in that case, it, it, there Mary does intercede and, and they, are all, they can see her from, from their place of damnation where they're already experiencing. She prays for them and they already receive some, some respite from their, from their suffering in that moment. So that's it's a very interesting contrast. You have a similar text that's also circulating in Syriac and, and Christian Palestinian Aramaic uh, from about the same time. The manuscripts are from about the same time. We don't know where, where you have a different view of the afterlife in that intercession. Here, she intercedes for them at the end of time. What's really fascinating to me, though, is that so that, that section of text is only present in the medium and the short recensions because the long recension, we don't have, like, all the manuscripts are fragmentary. So they're all lacunos at that point. So we don't know what was in the long recension. But there is no response from Christ to that request, which is really strange. In this text, whenever Mary asks for something throughout, Christ always says, or the angels who are talking to her, whoever it is, they say, you will receive whatever you ask for, like your will is done in heaven as, as whatever you request on earth. So it kind of takes up the, um, not just the, our father, you know, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, but also whatever you ask for on earth will be about, like, will be done in heaven where two or three are gathered together. There's, there's several passages like that where Christ makes promises in the gospels to, to believers. And, and so it takes up that language. And so there's this idea that Mary can like help you with anything, whatever she asks for is given because she's the, the mother of Christ who is God. Um, and yet at that moment in the text where she asks for uh, mercy for the, for the, deceased sinners, nothing is said. It's just, it ends there. You don't know if her, her request is going to be granted. As I started looking more and more at how the cult is constructed, it never tells people to, it never, it never promises that she will pray for the living. It tells you, and the preferred way of celebrating her feast is, is not to pray to her necessarily, but to commemorate her, uh, bring the food offering, etc. cetera. It doesn't mean that people weren't praying to her. Um, it's interesting because there's stories about her doing all sorts of miracles and bilocating while she's still alive. And it's like a list of short miracle stories. And in each one, there's just a short prayer where somebody says somebody's being attacked by a dragon or they lost all their money or the kid found, fell down the well. And in each case, they say, uh, Mark, Mary, have mercy on me. So, so my lady Mary, have mercy on me. And in that moment, she bilocates, she comes, she kills the dragon, she pulls the kid out of the well, she helps him find the money, etc. And, and then it moves on to the next story. So if you're listening to this, you know, in the church, you're you're for sure you're going to pick up that phrase and for sure it's going to be easy as anything to go home and to pray that whenever you're in trouble so when we look at other hagiographical texts that are circulating especially in a west syriac but not just west syriac also east syriac context in this time there is prayer to the saints so it's not that people aren't praying to mary it's just that the text never presents um that is happening uh as people praying to her or that she's sorry interceding for them after her death there's one exception to this, which I think kind of proves the rule. There's liturgical instructions for how to celebrate her feast day. In the short recension, uh, the priest is supposed to pray over the bread. He does a Trinitarian invocation, and then the Holy Spirit comes and blesses the bread that people have brought in honor of Mary, and then they take it home and they eat it at home. 
But in the medium recension, he he prays a prayer. He says, uh, "Mart Mary, uh, come and come." In, uh, I forget the exact words, but it's basically he's addressing Mary instead of the Holy Spirit. And then Mary comes during the liturgical celebration, and she blesses the bread, and then they take it home and they eat it. Now that's really fa a really fascinating kind of difference, and it's the only time that you see Mary interacting with the living in the whole in all the recensions of the, of the departure. Sadly, we don't have the the long recension is Lacunos at that point, so we don't know what's going on there in the long recension. But you could see why, uh, so the text is generally has um, what we might call proto-Orthodox early Trinitarian affirmations that tells you that you need to also believe in the Trinity, you need to believe in Christ who is God uh, in order to receive the benefits of Mary's prayers. So it it seems to be ha have been sort of put through a process of somebody who's worried about proto-Orthodox Miaphysite theology. Um, it talks about Christ as being um, God who died, etc. So there's some Miaphysite language there as well. So you would understand that maybe they're editing out some of these things that are probably happening, but they're probably kind of concerned about that. That, that would be my, my, my understanding. Um, one final really interesting point on this. Uh, there's a story that the departure has about the Mary's final moments that it shares with the obsequies, the other text that is circulating in Syriac. Mary's in her house in Jerusalem. They have a funeral procession. They carry her out of the city. There's a Jewish man who attacks the beer um, and he tries to overturn it. And as he touches the beer, his hands, his arms get severed and they're hanging there and he's bleeding out. And so he cries out for mercy. And um, in, in, each, in each version, either the apostles or Mary prays for him, etc., his arms reattach miraculously. In both versions, they give him a staff, and then he's supposed to go and preach. Uh, and then they go on and to Mary's burial site outside of Jerusalem. In the obsequies, Mary dies in Jerusalem. Like that whole sequence, she's already dead. And then she's just buried. And then she intercedes from the afterlife. In the departure, it's the same sequence of events. Scholars have already noted that these are probably related, even though the two texts are from very different families. But in this case, Mary's still alive. In Jerusalem, on her funeral beer procession, she's still alive. She's still alive outside the city. And at that point, outside the city, Christ comes, and then she has a really long section of praying for all the needs of everybody who's ever going to pray for her. So it's really fascinating. All of her intercession, according to the departure, happens before she dies. And then when you celebrate her feast day, you will make the offerings of bread. Then you get applied to you those prayers that she already did, uh, according to the text, before she died. And given that there's another version of this in which she's already dead and here in the departure, no, she's still alive. And there's some sort of literary relationship between those sections of the text. I think it's actually really fascinating to think about what they're trying to do. They're trying to keep her alive. The intercession is happening before she's dead. And then after that, um, she passes away. And you can access that intercession, which kind of is on, it must be ongoing since she she's so powerful and she's praying for all of your future needs. Like everybody who's going to be captive in war, all of your agricultural needs, um, all sorts of, there's some some spiritual benefits, some freedom from, you know, demons, etc. cetera. Um, so she's kind of being presented as somebody who can pray for all these different things before she passes away. That's really long. Sorry, I, I kind of uh, took off there, but hopefully that's interesting. Hopefully. Yeah, no, that's absolutely fascinating. It opens up a lot of other questions, but uh, yeah. Stimulating. I see we have other questions, so I'll keep my follow-ups for later in case, but thanks. Indeed, we still have some time for questions. Um, Adrian, please. Adrian. Hi, Andrew. Nice to see you again. Um, just uh, two quick comments and the question. It, you already discussed this actually in your previous response a bit, but <clears throat> so first of all, um, I think the Arabic uh, early Arabic version of the six books, which I think depends on the longer recension, also contains this uh, intercession with no response. Mm. Thank you. That's <clears throat> so, really helpful. Which I think uh, confirms what you uh, said before. Then the other thing is that it, it appears to me from your response is that uh, Mary can intercede for the living, but not for the dead. So maybe it's not so much that she is alive and makes um, does miracles, but also um maybe there's a discussion about more generally she can intercede for people who pray for her on earth let's say or during this life but she is not she's not capable of interceding for people who already await their uh reward or punishment in the in the afterlife i don't know if that's um one way to see see things 
And then the question is more generally about the obsequious and the six books, sort of the relationship between the two. I mean, now after all the work that you uh, have done on, on these texts, do you think there's, um, you know, do we have enough material to reevaluate the relationship between the two? Or uh, what can you say about, you know, do they have two, two different audiences? Is the one a response to the other? Um, are they competing cults? Um, is it still helpful to sort of divide these families in such in such strict uh, manner? Also, given that you have this Jacob of Saruk text that uh, we also talked about uh, in the past, so uh, or you know, is there just more work to be done on the link between the two texts? Mm. I, I yeah, uh, I'll start with your your first kind of thought about intercession. I was thinking about this because I was thinking about what the term intercession means. Um, if it means that she's still actively involved in an ongoing prayer for the living, I think that's what was kind of absent from, like after her death, I think there's, that's absent from the departure. That we see her interceding for the dead, but not getting results. Um, on the other hand, if we talk about intercession in the sense of actually getting results for the living. Yes, she gets results for the living, but not really for the dead, at least not until the final judgment. And we don't really know that from the text. So I think I think that's kind of a, a something I was thinking I maybe need to define that a bit better. What does it mean? Like she is interceding. It, it, the text doesn't really show her still actively interceding uh, after she passes, like from the afterlife, except for the dead in that one time. There is... Uh, there but, is I mean, the... For instance, you know, you have, sorry, uh, yeah. this... Uh... Um, thing in the preface, you know, where yeah. the whole thing about the Book of Mary being rediscovered. Yes, that's what I was going to come to. Yeah, okay, great. So so in that, that's the one time where she seems to be aware, uh, well, other than the liturgical instructions where she shows up apparently if you if the priest prays her. So that, that's kind of the one exception. But, but you're right, in the preface, she seems to be aware that there are uh, monks coming from Sinai to Ephesus in the year 497, 498 um, in search of her book. And she's aware of that. And she says, okay, now it's time to reveal the book that's been hidden with John underground all this time. What's interesting is she doesn't go directly to them. She goes to John and the text specifies twice who is alive underground. So he's kind of in this marginal state. He He's miraculously underground, still alive, uh, somehow maybe corresponding to the scriptural text where Christ says to Peter, what is it to you if I want him, the disciple he loved to kind of uh, remain until I come back. So he's the text twice says he's he's alive underground, and that was a popular belief we know um, as as you've you've written about as well um, that we have a lot of witnesses to. And she goes to him and says, "Now you reveal the book to them." And he's the one who actually appears to them. So I I thought that kind of was interesting as well that she doesn't just appear to the monks. I was that just just to come back to you. Was that kind of what you were thinking about, or was there something else from the preface as well? Well, also the fact that they are, um, it is said that people should pray for her and sort of do this liturgical program so that they can be delivered from uh, from wrath, right? So so people are praying to her, that's for sure. Yeah, yeah. The question is kind of like, is she praying for them? And I, I know that it's, maybe I'm splitting hairs here, but I, I as I started looking at the language, um, several times it talks about calling on her name. So it uses the, the verb um, crow. Uh, and then, you know, her name. But when it starts to unpack that, Christ says, whoever calls upon me in your name, I will answer them. He's sort of telling her that he's going to answer the prayers of the people who are calling upon her name. So people are definitely praying to her, but the text somehow, I don't know if it's intentional or if it's just the language. I think this is where I would need to look at many more hagiographical texts and kind of put it in context and say, is this just the way Syriac text in that time talk about intercession or is there something special going on here in this text that's i haven't answered that question fully yet um when it comes to the um the relationship between the the obsequies and the departure i i this let's say the strength of my research is that i'm really just focusing on the departure um because i'm benefiting from all the other research that's done the comparison work so i would need to step back and and do a lot more to be able to say if we're reevaluating but to give you an example um, that I thought was quite interesting, the whole the whole scene where Mary is being taken out of Jerusalem that I, I compared that's the same in both the obsequies and the departure. In both of them, Mary or the apostles give this healed Jewish man a staff. Now, in the departure, that staff has never shown up before. 
but somehow out of nowhere, there's a staff, they give it to him. He's supposed to take that and he's supposed to use that to preach and do miracles. Okay. But as we know, in the obsequies, the, the palm staff, sometimes tra it's transformed into a book, etc. But it's, it's a theme throughout the text. You know, it starts out with the angel who then is Christ giving Mary this staff, this palm branch from the tree of life in paradise. And that's passed on from her to John and then passed on to this Jewish man, etc. So, so for me, that would seem to indicate that somehow it's a, it, it makes more sense within the obsequies and somehow this story has been tra transferred and changed uh, in the departure. Are they taking it from the obsequies? I don't know. Are they coming from a shared tradition? I really don't know. Um, but it is fascinating. And I think maybe we've talked about this, that in the preface, in the frame story of the departure, they, the monks from Sinai who are looking for the Book of Mary, they start because they say, like, there is no account of what happened to her in all the Mediterranean world in the year 809 Anno Grecorum, so 497, 498. And they search everywhere, you know, Jerusalem, and they write to bishops all over the place, etc. And there's no account whatsoever. So that's a, that's a bold statement when you know that you have a manuscript with the obsequies, this other text, that's from the 5th century in Syriac. And you have a Syriac text to the departure from you know, the end of the end of the fifth cent, uh, end of the fifth century, beginning of the sixth century, that's saying no other account exists, you know, about the end of Mary's life. I, I think that's that's kind of suggestive. I think that's quite a, quite an interesting um, sort of polemic where they're trying to do something here with it. Um, obviously, as you know, the I mean, the obsequies has all sorts of um, sort of not proto orthodox ideas in it, uh, very strange ideas about the state of the soul after death and Christ sometimes being an angel, sometimes being Christ. Uh, it implies that Mary sinned. It, there's there's debates about, you know, whether and she's afraid to die because she sinned, et cetera, didn't have faith. So it's a very different view of Mary and of Christ than this proto-Orthodox view you have in the departure. So I think that's also interesting. So a few comparisons. More than that, I, I'd, I'd hesitate to say at this point. Um, yeah, I hope that's... Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, great. For our final question, um, uh, let's turn to Sebastian Brook, please. Hi, Sebastian. Thank you very much, Andrew. That was wonderful. Um, I wondered, what do you think about the relationship to the East Syriac tradition in the text that Budge <clears throat> published long ago? There's so many parallels. Um, I had a chance to compare the East Syriac, um, uh, yeah, the history of the Blessed Virgin, the East Syriac. So, so it's a, a bit later, and it's it combines the departure with um, the Proto Gospel of James and elements from the Infancy Gospel of Thomas. The one thing I, I looked at a bit that hadn't, I don't think has been done before is I found that the details in Budge's version are from the Long Recension. Um, there are there are details there that are not found in the Medium and the Short Recensions. Um, so that was that's interesting. May, maybe you know one one thing that is potentially helpful. Um, yeah, I'm trying to remember if there's anything else that, that that's the only thing that I have off the top of mm. my head. Well, that's it's very helpful. Thank you. Then I propose that at this point, we thank our speaker, we thank Andrew for this very engaging talk and also for widening our perspective so much during the discussion session. Thank you. Thank you, friends. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew, and thanks everybody for joining. Yes, thank you for joining. See you next Bye. time.